that he uh, he supported. Uh, Michael Stewart Foley is our author tonight. Michael grew up in New England, a typical Irish American family. Uh, family moved around a lot when he was a kid, six times before he was seven years old. But there were a couple of things that were really consistent in his family. They were really political from the, the standpoint. They, they loved politics, national and local politics. They were Democrats, pro-union, loved FDR and JFK. But his father also stressed the importance of the ability to write. As he put it, uh, you needed to have a command of the English language in order to succeed. And, and Michael combined all of those things. It's a great background for the preparation for uh, Citizen Cash, the political life and times of, of Johnny Cash. In addition to this book, Michael has written or edited seven other books, including Confronting the War Machine or Front Porch Politics. He is a historian of popular culture and a historical advisor to films and TV shows like Mad Men. And he's also a professor of American civilization at his home in France. Also joining us tonight is historian and Georgia State University professor John McMillan. John is the author of a number of books, including American Epidemics, uh, reporting from the front lines of the opioid crisis, smoking typewriters, the 60s underground press and rise of alternative media, Beatles and Stones, and he is the co-founder, or uh, co-founding editor, rather, of the 60s, the Journal of History, Politics, and Culture. We're going to have a conversation between the two of them, but all of us uh, in the audience will get a chance to ask questions. At the bottom of the screen, there is a little place where you can type in your question, and I'll be monitoring that, and we'll get to those uh, in just a little bit. So now it's time to sit back and learn about uh, Johnny Cash. And so gentlemen, Michael and John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for the so great much. introduction. Yes, absolutely. And um, well, I, I think I've done a couple of events with help from the Carter Center and Acapella Books, and it's just a great pleasure. Thank you very much for hosting both of us. I wish we could be together in person, um, but this will have to do. One reason I want to be, in, I would like to be in person is because Mike and I are really good friends. So I'll just say that from the outset, we've known each other for about 20 years and it's been a really rewarding and, and wonderful friendship uh, during that period. And it occurred to me just recently that over that 20 year period, there have been many times that I've heard you talk about this book, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is coming out now. So there's a long gestation period. Uh, as Tony just mentioned, you've done a lot of other things in the, in the interim. Um, I liked the, in the introduction, you told a story about the, the first and only time that you went to a high-end auction. And it was an auction that was selling uh, Johnny Cash memorabilia, which you acknowledge you could not have afforded. Uh, right. You had an interesting and, and edifying experience there. I wondered if you would just start by sharing that. Uh, sure, thanks. I mean, uh, this speaks exactly to the point you just made that you've heard me talking about Johnny Cash for 20 years because uh, this was in um, 2004, right? Uh, after Cash and June Carter had both passed away and the estate was auctioning off all of their affairs at Sotheby's. And I had, I had been working on this other book that Tony mentioned about the Vietnam War. And in 2002, uh, Sony and where Columbia had come out with this concert recording that had never been released before. That was from December of 1969. Um, that was recorded at Madison Square Garden and at which Johnny Cash starts speaking uh, quite a lot, in fact, about the Vietnam War. So that had really piqued my interest because I was a Cash fan and I didn't know that he even had said anything about the Vietnam War until I heard that recording. So when the auction was taking place, I decided to just go check it out, not really sure what I would learn. And I was about to give up, in fact, because I thought this is kind of pointless, like it's just one person after another bidding on, you know, a pair of his cowboy boots or something. And um, this couple came in and sat down next to me, kind of excited, you know, they had just arrived, the bidding had already started. And the woman 
at some point asked me what I thought I was going to bid for. And, you know, like you said, I was a poor assistant professor at the time. There was pretty much nothing I could afford. So I sheepishly said, well, I'm just here as a historian, you know, mm -hmm. and then that kind of piqued her interest. And she asked me, you know, why would a historian be interested in Johnny Cash? And I said something about the Vietnam War and she kind of cut me off and said, well, anybody who knows anything about Johnny Cash knows he was Republican, right? I said, well, I don't, I don't know about that. I think people might have different ideas about his political background. And I quoted from uh, the man in black, you know, about uh, wearing black for the poor and the beaten down. And, um, and she said, oh, well, yeah, sure. But he, that's because he was a Christian, you know, he cared about people, obviously. And, you know, so we had this kind of like friendly debate and it, it, it only uh, kind of affirmed this idea in my head that I, I should investigate this further because I had read other cash biographies. I'd read his own uh, autobiography and nobody had ever really grappled with the politics of Johnny Cash in a way that I thought was particularly satisfying. So, and it was interesting because, you know, there is this thing where people who self describe themselves as either Republicans or Democrats or liberals or conservatives, they all kind of claim him. Um, and so I was interested in why that was too. Uh, you, you describe in the book some fascinating early experiences that Johnny Cash had uh, that casual fans might not be aware of. Uh, he grew up in tremendous deprivation during the Great Depression. His older brother, who he loved a lot, died in a freakish and gruesome and bizarre accident. Uh, and then during World War II and shortly after the war, he was a code breaker for the United States military, where he played a really important role. And I was just curious, you know, which of the formative experiences in Johnny Cash's life do you think might have played the biggest role in, in shaping his, his politics and his, his artistry? I mean, it's hard to say which one of all of those was the most important. Um, I would probably lean towards saying that it was growing up in poverty and, and witness to real poverty and deprivation around him. You know, his family was much more fortunate than a lot of other impoverished families in Northeast Arkansas at the time. You know, he was surrounded by, uh, you know, an enormous population of landless farmers, sharecroppers who were really destitute. And his, fam his family at least had the benefit of being helped by the Roosevelt administration to be resettled in a new community where they were loaned, uh, you know, the resources to get themselves back on their feet. So a kind of combination of those things is really important. But part of that too is the wartime experience that you describe where he, his brother died not at war, but during the war, making extra money for the family, um, still because of their enduring poverty during the war. Um, and then he, you know, he serves in the military, like you say, in the early Cold War, and has, you know, a, a working man's kind of uh, veterans experience, you know, because he was basically joins the Air Force as soon as the Korean War breaks out, because had he not, he would have been drafted for sure. Um, and so I think he has a real empathy and sympathy for people who find themselves in these kinds of circumstances, which are not really of their own choosing um, and which are controlled, the forces of which are controlled by others, you know. Both my, my mother and my grandmother were Johnny, Fash, Johnny Cash fans to, to some degree. I was telling you the, the other day that I, I think I have very early childhood memories of watching some Johnny Cash specials with our family. Right. Um, and at one time there was a Johnny Cash autograph in our house, which is strange if you know my family because we don't collect memorabilia and they're not really, neither of my parents were deeply into pop music. Mm -hmm. But they loved Johnny Cash and um, they would watch that show. And, uh, and yet at the same time, they were not political in, in any conventional sense. Certainly my mother and my grandmother would vote, but that would be about it. Um, but you suggest that that show sometimes would carry subversive messages that, that might have still resonated with people in ways that maybe even they didn't, they didn't understood. Um, what, are, what are some of the ways that the show could have been subversively political? I mean, subversive, I'm not sure I would use the term subversive. Um, like I get the impression from talking to a lot of people who watch that show, you know, including some of my older siblings that they felt like, the, the subversive thing was that he brought on these young 
uh, radical artists, you know, to perform alongside kind of mainstream country music stars. But I don't, I, I think in the way that Cash uh, engaged with the public um, and what made him popular probably with your grandmother and mother who didn't think of themselves as particularly political was that he okay. was on this, he had this television show that appeared every single week and practically every week he weighed in in one way or another on some of the most pressing issues that were facing the country. And he did it in a way that was kind of very open and not heavy handed, you know, not like <clears throat> this is what I believe and this is what you should think. I'm not, you know, he was trying to force some ideological line on you. And he came across as a guy who was trying to make sense of really complicated political circumstances in the way that a lot of his viewers were, right? Um, and I think that really resonated. And so it doesn't come off, for, you know, on first glance, you could watch some of these episodes and think, well, you know, isn't that nice that he's talking about young people, you know, who are, who are, you know, questioning the wisdom of their elders, or maybe not, maybe, you know, it's nice that he's saying something positive about servicemen or about prisoners or something, you know, and he had these various ways on the television show of introducing discussion about these issues that were important to him. But like I say, not in a way where he was kind of forcing it down anybody's throat, you know, so it didn't feel like he was out waving a political campaign banner or was, you know, marching at the front of a march. It was just like he was a citizen and he was doing what he thought citizens should do, which is that they should consider these issues thoughtfully, you know, and weigh them for themselves. Um, and so that, I think that's really, that platform and that television show are enormously important, important to understanding him as a public citizen, you know, without that platform, okay. there's other, there's other ways that he, he engages political issues, but the TV show for those, you know, from 1969 to 1971 is the primary platform. The, the, the topic of Johnny Cash and race relations is a, is a complicated one. And I, I appreciated the sensitivity with which you addressed it. Um, we obviously cannot call Johnny Cash the civil rights hero. Uh, and in fact, you describe an episode in the book that I was not aware of. It's such a grotesque episode when he behaved very shamefully. I don't know if you, you care to discuss it, but you also describe him as someone who was able to develop a capacity for for transcending or overcoming some of the racism in his midst, uh, how do you? What can you say about that that fraught topic? Well, <clears throat> I could say a lot. Um, <laughs> he's because uh, it is a complicated story, right? He he grows up in northeastern Arkansas in a community that's entirely white, that's deliberately um, segregated. I mean, established by a, a government agency that expressly said, we're not gonna go against local norms, right? Much as we might like to. So we're not gonna try to establish like an integrated farm community here, right? Um, and it's clear that he grows up among racists. Uh, that there are people in his family tree who are racists, maybe an uncle who may have been a member of the Klan. Um, he certainly has Confederate uh, ancestry, right? Um, and that's an important part of his identity. And then, we know because of letters that were published by his first wife in her um, memoir that he had these particularly ugly episodes that you referred to when he'd get drunk in Germany when he was in the Air Force and got into these altercations. It doesn't seem like they ever got physical, but altercations with black servicemen. And then he recounts these back to her in particularly grotesque language, you know, the language of racists. So it's safe to say that by the time, you know, as a young man, he's, he's a racist. He hasn't shaken himself loose with these racist attitudes, right? <clears throat> but then a few things happen in the years after he gets out of the Air Force. One is that he moves to Memphis, right? This town that's majority black population. And he can spend, you know, whole days in a way that he never had in his life before. Um, encountering no one but black people, including poor black people who he as a salesman was meant to be selling things to and who he starts to relate to and starts to see a kind of shared experience in their poverty and deprivation that he relates to his own uh, 
upbringing. But the other thing is really important is that he becomes kind of obsessed with these field recordings that, you know, Alan Lomax and others did. Um, and particularly this one record that came out in 1959 called Blues in the Mississippi Night, which is one of the most explosive, I think, most explosive recordings ever to come out on a uh, on vinyl in the United States, describing segregation from the perspective of these three blues artists who are so uh, scared of this record coming out and their families facing retaliation that they insist that pseudonyms be used, right? And it's at that point you can see that Cash, in his own work, he starts to record some of the same songs, right? And he starts to develop this sense of kind of a Lomaxian sense himself, a commitment to social realism and to documenting reality. So what I describe in the book is not really him in, say, 1962, running to the front of a civil rights march, but instead putting out a record called Blood, Sweat and Tears, which we usually think of as like a kind of folk record with a bunch of work songs on it. But in fact, most of the work songs are about exploited black men being terrorized, right? Uh, subjects to horrific violence, lynchings, right? And some of these songs he first heard on Blues in the Mississippi Night. And so I think it's that kind of commitment to documenting uh, the social reality, which he had seen around him. He'd seen this in various ways. He'd seen chain gangs, he'd seen sharecroppers abused, right? Um, that you know, he undergoes a really important kind of transformation across that period of the 50s and 60s. So that by the time he has the television show, he's, you know, pretty much a, an obvious advocate for racial equality in the way that he presents race on the television show. So was he ever, was he ever called to account for those letters? When did they come out? And did he ever have to answer for them? He never did because they they came out after he died. That that book that uh, Vivian um, Cash's first wife put out came out. In fact, after she had passed, just after she had passed away in two thousand eight. Um, so they, you know, I think Cash fans who read, you know, everything that's ever come out about Cash would be aware of those letters, um, but they haven't. I don't think anybody's really dealt with them in the question of race uh, in particular detail until now. It's interesting to think about because sometimes when people are drunk, they say things that they, they, they reveal something that maybe they've repressed that's not socially acceptable. But right. other times people say, you know, things that uh, they just speak out nonsense and you give them a pass. If you look at the balance of his life, I think you do a good job of treating that issue with, with sensitivity. Yeah, thank you. Um, his best known albums were his prison albums. Those are the ones that I like the most. And he clearly had a special empathy or, or bond with prisoners. Uh, but I don't know if people are aware of how that developed. So I wonder if you could you could discuss that. Sure. I mean, he, you know, he had spent some time in jail himself, right? He'd had a few run-ins with the law, never spent more than a night or two in jail. Um, and he never went to prison, although there was, this was a widely held belief. Uh, even after the Folsom prison record came out, people assumed that you he was performing as a prisoner in the prison, you know, would send letters to the prison, you know, addressed to Johnny Cash. Um, but he had never done prison time, but he had started performing at prisons uh, as early as 1957. And he did this kind of quietly, um, just relating again to men who I think, uh, you know, he understood as being impoverished most of the time, a lot of them from the South, like he was. Um, and you know, getting the short end of the stick sometimes in terms of their run-ins with the law. And so he gave many concerts, you know, uh, without much fanfare uh, at prisons over the years. He enjoyed playing them. Um, but as he talked about in interviews later, you know, it bothered him to see the looks in their eyes, like to see the soul, you know, kind of drained out of these human beings who are in these places, these horrible places doing hard time. And so part of what he wanted to do, especially with, with that first uh, at Folsom prison record was almost like Alan Lomax, you know, was to document the sounds of the institution itself and the sounds of the prisoners um, themselves. And you can 
you can get cash fans arguing pretty easily about which of the two prison albums is the best one. And there's actually a third one uh, that he did in Sweden, but the, the San Quentin and Folsom ones are the famous ones. And to me, the interesting thing about the Folsom record is that he doesn't, he doesn't really play any of his hits. Like he, he tailors the set list entirely to the experience of the prisoners. There's lots of songs about prisons. And of course, he's not the first country artist to write these kinds of songs or play these kinds of songs, but he's the first one to play these songs to the prisoners and capture their reaction on tape. And so it's a little bit hard for us to go back now because we're, we're cash fans know these records so well, and they've been released a million different ways. And we have both uh, complete sets, you know, in the box set that you can listen to, but to go back and listen to the original vinyl, you know, from 1968, and listen to that record fresh is really fascinating to think about the context of the times when, you know, you have a president, uh, Richard Nixon, who's run for office on a law and order campaign, the governor of California, where the prison was, uh, located and the concert was performed as Ronald Reagan, also very much law and order. And then here's Cash kind of, you know, taking the side of, you know, hardened criminals, you know. Um, so I think that's a really interesting example of his empathy, you know, of the way that he relates to people, um, even people who are clearly guilty of horrible crimes, you know. Well, part of what makes those records so extraordinary to me is it's the interaction with the audience. The songs are great, but there's also the sort of ambient noise and the responses that he gets to his songs. And would you be willing to talk about some of that, some of those dynamics on the records? Yeah, sure. I mean, he's, you know, there's a, there's a few songs on the records that I think are, you know, part of this is a product of the way that the, the producer and the label um, managed it like we know on the on the on side two of the Folsom record that they edited in some songs from the second set most of the record is made up from the first set and they kind of cleverly edit them in so there's a there's a kind of rise fall rise thing um, going on where you have like a really exciting song followed by a soft reflective song you know followed by another exciting song um, and but yeah you're right that he you know the way that he speaks to the prisoners in between the songs is as important as the things that he's singing you know so he clearly uh aligns himself with them when you know he's talking about the guards um or he's asked for a drink of water you know and they're slow to bring it to him and the crowd starts jeering at the prison personnel for not like treating their guests better and the sense that you have that they are you know, almost brothers behind bars is very clear, you know, and people wrote about this at the time, you know, in, uh, I think, Cream Magazine or Circus Magazine, uh, you know, a kind of rock and roll magazine, the writer was like, you know, where, where must this guy be at? Or maybe it was Rolling Stone, where must this guy be at to be able to relate to these prisoners in the way that he does? And people, people had, you know, somebody like Porter Wagoner had put out a prison themed record the year before, but it was all recorded in the studio. And it was all, you know, songs about prison. And he's dressed in, you know, a striped jumpsuit on the cover of the album, Porter Wagner is. But you don't get a sense like you do with Cash that, you know, he could be one of them, you know, and that he relates to them like brothers. So there's a video recording of one of those shows where he's giving what I see, what I take as a dirty or exasperated look towards a prison warden or a guard, you know? Yeah, what yeah. Talking? Those, those are funny moments. There's a tiny detail in your book that probably no one else besides me will ask about. You said that he <laughs> played with sometimes on variety bills, so he wasn't the only performer. And is it pot? And you said that some of the performers were strippers at the prison. That possibly you must be true because you wrote it. Well, it's it's a story that Merle Merle Haggard recounted the story many times that uh, oh, okay. on New Year's Eve one year um, that the the warden at San Quentin, right? Merle Haggard was convicted of uh -huh. uh, of armed robbery, you know, uh, and uh, was serving time at San Quentin. And Cash came in as the headliner on a bill that included other um, country artists, the Collins kids, for example, uh, which also seems like a kind of weird thing to have these like teenagers basically in this prison. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, like you can find Merle Haggard recount that story in multiple places. He said there were strippers in from San Francisco. And yeah, it seems... Um, I was just unlikely and unwise, but 
There you go. I, I, su I suppose that prison concerts have fallen by the wayside. I don't think this is something people do too often anymore. Or am I wrong? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. I, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I feel like I heard of someone doing one recently, but I can't think of who that is. And Cash himself, you know, continued to do them into the 80s, but uh, he started to lose his enthusiasm because he, as he said to the press many times, he felt like his work on behalf of prison reform wasn't really working, you know, that he didn't, he didn't see any positive effect coming from it. There's a, there's a pretty great, you can find it in the University of, or no, the State of California Archives has a, a full concert of him playing as uh, Soledad in about 1981 that's online. Um, and that would have been one of the later ones. I have some more substantive questions, but there's one little amusing tidbit that I want to address. Right. Kevin Cash once wrote in his liner notes in your book that you quote, he says that he could kill a jackrabbit with a Bowie knife from a distance of 40 yards. Yeah. And so clearly this story is not true. And, and there are other instances when he was not the world's most reliable narrator. Uh, in my own, and when I was researching my book on the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, I would sometimes encounter things like this. There are stories that I wish were true, because they sound great, right. but as a historian, we have to be very scrupulous about not, you know, passing along things that just strain credulity. And, and so I wonder how you dealt with this as a scholar, separating some of the lore and the myth around, around Johnny Cash from, from, from you know, the historical facts. Yeah, well, you know, it's difficult, as, as you know, from working on the Beatles and Stones, there's an enormous amount of mythology that surrounds any of these super popular artists. And, and, and a lot of it is self-created or it's manufactured by the label or by both, you know? And um, that episode, you know, that line that you mentioned where he says that he, he, he could kill a jackrabbit from 40 yards away with a buoy knife, right? Um, is in the, it's, a, it's in the liner notes of the ballads of the True West album, right? Which is, uh, one of a series of concept albums that he did uh, during the early and mid 60s where he was, you know, increasingly plunging into deeper and deeper drug addiction. And the thing is that in some of those albums, it's clear, and his manager even attested to this, that, the, you know, he didn't say so much as the drug addiction helped him, but it's clear that he became kind of obsessed with certain themes, right? in his drug adult state. And and if I can interrupt just real quick. Sure. He said it would be a very unlucky jackrabbit that would perish from a drug addict's toss of a Bowie knife from that <laughs> right. distance. Right, right. Which, I, you know, I think everything about, to me that, I know that's a very popular album with some Cash fans, but to me it's one of the weakest of the concept albums. Like it has, it's called Ballads of the True West. It has songs on it that are not even set in the West. They're set like in New Jersey. Um, and there's, you know, there's this kind of self mythology taking place in the liner notes. And that's, you know, I just thought when I read it, I think you'd have to be really good at throwing a Bowie knife really practiced to hit a jackrabbit, an enormously quick and instinctive animal. And knowing that he was in such a terrible way in terms of his drug addiction, it just seems completely ridiculous, right? Um, so you have to be, as a historian, you have to kind of be yeah. honest about that kind of thing, much as I, I wish it was true, you know? Right. Right. Um, In, in, in 1970, uh, Richard Nixon invited Johnny Cash to the White House and they met and Johnny Cash performed. And I can see why a person would want to accept uh, a White House invitation, but I can also see why someone like Johnny Cash might want to decline that particular one. Uh, yeah. He chose to attend, and, but it was an interesting story. So I wondered if you would explain uh, the story of what happened. Sure, I mean, it started because Cash, um, went on television at the beginning of the second season or the first regular season, because the, the first season of the television show had been a summer replacement season, you know. And in uh, January of 1970, he, at the beginning of the season, he said at, at one of these monologues that he often gave at the end of the show that, you know, we're thinking about peace uh, in this season and uh, I and my family stand behind President Nixon in his quest for peace. Um, now, this is really interesting 
for a lot of reasons, not least of which is that uh, there had been massive protests in the couple of months before that episode aired, the big moratorium protests that took place in Washington, in between which President Nixon had gone on national television and given the famous silent majority speech in which he kind of derided protesters, right, for being a silent but vocal majority who were humiliating the United States. So you could read Cash coming out, you know, in an episode that was shortly taped before January um, and sort of deciding that he's, you know, on the side of Nixon and where, where this national debate is taking place. And he had previously gone to Vietnam and performed for servicemen about a year earlier. Uh, and even at that time, um, you know, he had, he had told the servicemen in attendance that he, he wasn't supportive of the anti-war movement, right? Calling them also a swear word. Um, so Nixon, of course, wasn't a natural Johnny Cash fan. Um, Nixon kind of liked Broadway show tunes, uh, but somebody in his uh, White House staff informed him of this and invited him to the White House to perform in April of 1970. And Cash took the invitation, you know, um, it's a kind of famous episode in the history of Johnny Cash's career and, and, in the, and in his political engagement, because there was this whole dust up where someone in the Nixon White House staff asked him to play a couple of songs like Merle Haggard's Okie from Muskogee and this really awful kind of racist song by Guy Drake called Welfare Cadillac that really, you know, um, mocks people on welfare. A couple pretty mean songs as far as Johnny Cash was concerned and, and he wouldn't play them. Um, and he, he kind of, he did it gently, you know, he, he refused to play them by just saying, these aren't my songs, I'm going to play my set, you know. Um, but then he goes and he plays his set and at this, it's really interesting because if you listen to the whole concert, he starts off saying to this audience of about 300 people, of guests who, you know, really fought tooth and nail to get tickets to this uh, performance in the White House, that he, they just want to bring a little bit of the soul of the South to the White House that evening. Um, but about 20 minutes into the show, he kind of goes off script and starts talking about, you know, young people uh, and questioning the wisdom of their elders. And he introduces this new song called What is Truth, um, which is all about protesters and it's all about the Vietnam War it's very clear from the lyrics where he talks about you know a kid in Sunday teaching Sunday school and next year it might be his turn to lay his life down um, and we know from Dan Rather who was there as a CBS news reporter that the president seemed a little surprised that here's this guy who just said on his television show that he supports you know my plans for peace and now he's here saying 10 feet away from me singing this new song about young people questioning their elders. And then Cash says to him, Mr. President, we hope you know that you can bring the boys home faster or even sooner than you think you can, right? Um, that wasn't part of the script, clearly. So it makes for an interesting episode in, in sure. Cash's engagement with the Vietnam War, certainly. Well, you know, through a lot of the book, you describe this dynamic. You describe him you know, making statements or holding viewpoints in the 60s or 70s that could be described as, as liberal or even leftist. But he also had this, you know, really strong appeal to conservative listeners. And there are a lot of those as well. And don't take the question the wrong way. I, I think I agree with your analysis. But, you know, someone might say that, like every recording artist, Johnny Cash cared about his popular success. And we know that because early in his career, he allowed his record label to guide some some decisions and he appeared looking ridiculous in some photographs for commercial purposes. I found it amusing that you mentioned that in the Johnny Cash show, the uh, producers had decided that part of their formula would be to have an attractive woman on the show every night so that more people would attend or view rather. Um, so how do you know that when Johnny Cash, you know, would go back and forth between views that could be considered conservative or liberal, that he wasn't I mean, prevaricating and just simply trying to, to find ways to appeal to as many people as he could because he wanted them to, to buy his records. Right. It's a fair question because, um, as you say, you know, you, you, you might think that about any artist, right, who wants to keep, who wants to maintain the largest audience possible and wants to, 
you know, is willing to maybe speak out of both sides of their mouths so as not to either offend uh, anybody um, or, you know, maybe less cynically just wants to bring everybody together. You could make that case, you know. Um, but I really looked for that, you know. I really looked to find some evidence that somewhere either he or his manager um, were, you know, worried about alienating some part of their audience by him talking about or speaking up on one issue or another. And as far as I can tell, the evidence doesn't exist. You know, I think certainly by the time he had the television show, he was in a position to be much more fearless about that anyway, because he already had this enormous audience. You know, he was fantastically successful. And, you know, if he was, if he did think that maybe he was going to alienate some part of it and lose it, you know, it wasn't going to cost him, you know, financially necessarily, or in any way that would affect his own sense of, you know, himself, his self-esteem, his standing as an artist. But the thing is, is he was doing these things, you know, that one might regard as unpopular even before that, you know, he, he covers that song Custer by Peter Lafarge on the, on the Bitter Tears album, which is basically about the massacre of Custer's seventh cavalry, right? Um, at a time when, you know, the, we're at the height of the Cold War, at the start of the Vietnam War, the escalation of the Vietnam War, it could easily be misread as a kind of anti-militarism um, kind of song. And he didn't think anything of it. He, he performs it on the television show with Buffy St. Marie, you know, as they're sort of laughing through the story about, you know, uh, what happens to George Armstrong Custer, which is pretty ugly. Um, so I, I just don't, I, I think other people have kind of assumed, other scholars and biographers have kind of assumed that that was part of what he was doing by, by dabbling in folk music. He was trying to expand his audience into folk, but Johnny Cash didn't need to expand his audience into folk. You know, he already had an enormous following, even without very many hit songs in the 1960s. He was a Columbia Records star, and um, he was in a kind. He had a he had a, a certain amount of freedom because of that um, to do what he wanted. You know, the television show is a little bit different because he didn't have complete creative control over the television show. It was clear that he had guests on who he would have rather not had on, you know, a lot of Hollywood types that the, that the producers insisted on. Um, but we know that most of the musical guests, you know, were his idea and a lot of them he had to push for over the objections of some of the producers. So. Bruce Springsteen, whom I'm a very big fan of, managed to have a very long career where it was quite obvious where his sympathies were politically and the way that he would relate to people who were downtrodden or oppressed. But he managed to go a very long time without, I don't think ever, criticizing a Republican person by name until I think the Bush era and now the Trump era. And I think, he right. finally, I think he finally had enough. Yeah. Uh, but, but Johnny Cash never went quite that far. I guess. No, I don't. I mean, but it's possible that, you know, there's the famous story has been recounted in multiple places of Springsteen's, uh, you know, release of 41 shots, right. The song about Amadou Diallo being shot down by police and that, you know, reporters reporting on going to see him at play at Giant Stadium, you know, not long after that. And certain Springsteen fans, you know, when he started to play that song, turning their back on him. And then as soon as he broke into some hit song, they turned around and were cheering again. And I think, you know, fans have the capacity to do that sometimes, you know, even if, uh, you know, they may be in love with an artist for years and then write a song that they don't particularly care for, they might be willing to look the other way because on balance, they love everything else, you know? And I think that's possibly true with Cash too, you know? Or I probably. was at the show with our mutual friend, Jeremy Varon at Medicine Square Garden where he debuted that song. You know, All right, like, okay, yeah. Um, I was, I'll, we'll finish up in a minute and then let some other people ask questions. Uh, my last one has to do with, uh, I, was, I was struck by a blurb on the book by uh, historian Beth Bailey and she says that history is written for an era as much as about one. And, you know, Johnny Cash, of course, lived through a really difficult and tumultuous time during the Vietnam era. Um, but now, by, I think by many measures, I think we may be even more polarized and divided than people were then. 
Um, and I wonder how this affected your approach to the writing. I assume that, I know you've been thinking about this book for a long time, but you must have done most of the writing during the, the Trump era. And so I wonder how that might have shaped your approach and then can comment into that. Um, what are the lessons that maybe you think we could or should draw from Johnny Cash, a person who did try to transcend political labels in some pretty fundamental ways? Well, you're right that I did. I did think about it. Um, obviously, it was impossible not to. Um, and it didn't have so much to do with, you know, particular political figures so much as it did with the way that we talk about politics in the United States and the terms of debate and discussion that we use, right? Um, you know, one thing that drives me crazy is always speaking in these kind of binary terms of some you know, like on election night, everything's red and blue and that's it. And, you know, someone's either a liberal or a conservative or they're a Democrat or a Republican. Um, and we know that, you know, the, lots of people um, don't fit squarely into any of those categories, even if they might self label themselves that way. It all depends on kind of the issue that's up for discussion. And part of that discourse is that, you know, in recent years, um, it's not uncommon to hear common public, you know, political commentators say that we're living in kind of unprecedented polarized times. To a historian, that just drives you nuts when people say unprecedented, because almost always you can find a precedent, um, regardless of what we're talking about. And we can say, I'm sorry, we can say nearly unprecedented, can't we? I mean, I don't think so. We had a civil war, you know, and, and we refer so. we refer to the the '60s as a as also you know Michael Kazin in Morris Isserman's book is, um, you know, America divided uh, the civil war years, right? Talking about the '60s as a civil war. I think the people who lived in these periods that were polarized also thought of themselves as living in unprecedentedly polarized times. So. It's, it was impossible to write the book without also thinking about that, right? The thinking that in this in this period of the Vietnam War, um, which had clearly divided the nation, of uh, urban uprisings, of campus uprisings, right? Of division over, um, you know, the generation gap, right? Um, over uh, crises in, of faith, for example, right? That this is the way that this is the way that public figures talked about. The United States in 1969, 70, 71. So I think, you know, Cash, by inhabiting this politics of empathy that existed outside or within, you know, these categories that kind of straddled these categories that we usually use to talk about politics, is useful for our times, right? It's useful to remind us that we can talk about politics um, and political culture outside of those terms of debate and that we can demand better, you know, of our public commentators um, to be more nuanced and more subtle in the way that they discuss American politics and that it's okay, you know, for all of us, for our children, if they don't feel like they fit a particular label or fit into a particular political box, you know? Um, and in that way, I think that's what Beth Bailey spotted, you know, is that this is, this is a guy who has, you know, died 18 years ago, but uh, in the way that he thought about his citizenship, he, he acted in a way that is a model for our own times. Terrific. I think that's really well put. And uh, that's, I think that's the thing that I like most about Johnny Cash and the thing that I, I learned the most while reading the book. Um, so I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, I see Tony is, I mean, are you, are you going to moderate the questions? Right. Well, I want to remind folks that they can put questions in the, the Q and a box. Um, but before we get to that, Michael, I was just going to ask if Johnny Cash wanted to use his television program to, to speak out, why not do it more blatantly, like perhaps the Smothers Brothers? Yeah, well, I think one reason is the Smothers Brothers. <laughs> you know, they, uh, they kind of paid for it by facing the CBS censors all the time. And um, I think, 
that's that's perhaps one reason is that you know that that preceded the cash show and he was aware of it but i also think it wasn't really it wasn't in his temperament to be so blatant you know um and in the way that i was mentioning earlier where he is kind of thinking out loud about some of these issues you know in the way that he would present it for example a political question on his ride this train segment where he would take viewers on this trip to some place in America's past or some other place in American life. And he would get, try to get viewers to kind of put themselves in the shoes of other people um, that he seemed much more comfortable with. Now, at times he could be pretty direct about it in the case of native Americans, for example. Um, and in the case of prisoners, uh, he did over time by the, by the time we get to the end of his last season, he's much more, direct about the way that he talks to his viewers about those issues. Um, but he was never, you know, he never comes across as as towing an ideological line or a partisan line. It's always like, I'm just a citizen thinking about these things like you are. And this is what I think, you know. Mm -hmm. One of our, our viewers was asking, referred to the um... Cash's cover of the cowboy Jack Clements novelty song, one on the right is on the uh, on the left in 65, and says, you know, a song that parodies the travails of musicians wading into politics. What do you feel are some of the main milestones that later radicalized him, even to the point of making his earlier recording of that song seem more like a parody? Well, the interesting thing about that song is he, he performs that song on the television show a couple of times, um, at least twice that I can think of. Um, and one time he does it with the, uh, the Tennessee Three, his backing band, and Carl Perkins dressed up in these kind of exaggerated hippie costumes, you know? Um, and he kind of laughs after they perform the song. They perform right at the opening of one of, an, one of those episodes. And he goes, oh, you know, Tennessee flower children or something like that, you know. So he's still, I mean, it's very interesting because that song, as you say, that Jack Clement wrote is effectively, you know, takes a shot at all the political folk singers, the kind of Phil Oaks of the world um, saying, you know, keep your politics to yourself is a line in the song, you know, when it comes to singing the folk songs of our land, you know, keep the politics to yourself. Um and Cash was able to, you know, still perform that song on his television show, still poke a little bit of fun, you know, at folk singers and perhaps at himself, right? Um, even at hippies, you know, because he's got him dressed up in these kind of exaggerated costumes. While at the same time, defending young people, you know, in this monologue he gives about encountering lots of young people on the Sunset Strip in Los Angeles and finding that they're like decent people, you know, that if you'd had crowds like that in his town growing up, there'd have been a fight every 20 feet, but that doesn't happen, you know, in what he saw out on the Sunset Strip. So he's able to, he's still able to have a laugh, you know, and poke a little bit of fun. Um, but it's clear from the way that he, he engages these political issues um, a, a across like a wide variety of political issues and in many different ways on the television show that he still takes those things very seriously, you know. How did other artists, I mean, you've got Lee Greenwood singing, you know, God Bless the USA, and as you mentioned, Merle Haggard, Oki from Muskogee. How did artists like that feel about Johnny Cash and his songs, his views? I mean, for the most part, you know, he, because of the standing he had, um, particularly after the Folsom prison record, and, you know, he wins all these awards and he gets the television show. I think, you know, he's in the, at that moment, he was in the pantheon of American country music stars, and they held him in very high regard, even if they didn't share exactly the same views. And, you know, on the television show, he brought Merle Haggard on, uh, and Merle Haggard sang Oki from Muskogee and the fight inside of me, you know, these songs that were seen as kind of like we'd call them dog whistle songs today for American conservatives and people who were hawks, you know, and supported Richard Nixon. Um, but on the same episode, he debuted What is Truth, right? Um, and on an episode where he let 
Arlo Guthrie sing this song that's really critical of Spiro Agnew and uh, the Nixon administration. He then gave this monologue at the end about how there were still a lot of great things happening in this country that they'd played a bunch of county fairs that summer. And, you know, people came with their prized heifers and their apple pies. And he kind of like, you know, launches himself into a nostalgia trip, you know. Um, so I think it was pretty hard for uh, people who didn't share his political views to feel like he didn't at least give him a chance to air them you know, on the same kind of platform. Um, and he had, you know, he had a wide range of political views from other artists uh, that come through on the television show. Of course, he's it's his show. So he gets the last word. Yeah. One of our viewers was asking if you see an, an artist who is reminds you of, of Johnny Cash today. I mean, I see lots of artists, you know, not only country music artists, but if we stick to country music, there's, a, there's quite a few who, um, I think take their citizenship seriously and speak out on political issues and because of social media can do it, you know, even more regularly. Um, and across, you know, again, kind of across the political spectrum and kind of um, in between categories too, you know, um, I think my favorite, my personal favorite was because I was asked this once uh, is like if somebody, if there was somebody in country music today who could have a television show like this, who would I pick? And I said Margot Price, because um, I think Margot Price does the same kind of subtle, like engaged uh, citizen kind of art uh, in her music. Um, she's she's more of like a mix of Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson and Loretta Lynn, probably in the way that she she captures, you know, uh, issues about or engages with issues that are important to women engages issues about farming because she came from a farm that was lost in the 80s farm crisis and her marijuana advocacy like Willie Nelson you know um, and I think and also in the way that she kind of stands separate from the Nashville establishment you know that's my personal view but I think you know there's lots of other artists who are also doing the same kind of work. Um, and that's an uh, encouraging sign. You know, I think the worst thing that can happen, as I allude in the book's introduction, is is that people can have a knee-jerk reaction to celebrities um, and even the most earnest and well-informed artists because they feel like they're just, you know, abusing their platform as a star or something. And it's just like, you know, go back to singing or whatever it is you do. Um, but you know, and Springsteen, for example, has been very eloquent about saying that the artist has an important role to play, um, an important role as a citizen to play in the life of the country. And I think Cash understood that instinctively. instinctively. Now, one of one of our viewers was asking why you think at times Cash would speak bolder than other artists, but then would still sometimes pull his punches uh, in how he phrased his criticisms? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think, you know, one of the things that um, became clear to me in doing the research uh, for the book was that he, you know, he, he enters these waters um, pretty tentatively. Like, for example, on that Blood, Sweat and Tears album, um, where, you know, it, it, it can be no accident that he makes the first three songs on that album, this kind of harrowing tale of black working men in America, right? But he doesn't really call attention to it. It's sort of like playing the prison concerts and benefit shows. He's not like waving his hand saying, I'm out here doing this. But over the course of the 60s, and by the time he has his television show, he becomes more um, confident, you know, in speaking out as a citizen. And he said himself that by the time he did the Bitter Tears album, which is only a few years after the Blood, Sweat, and Tears album. He was done pulling his punches. Um, I don't think that's entirely true because he did kind of pull his punches a little bit on things like Vietnam. And I think you could watch the TV show or read his statements and, and wish, you know, as a Cash fan who feels one way or another about a political issue that he had been more bold, that he had spoken out more strongly or perhaps less uh, tritely at times on certain issues. Um, and, you know, why he did or did not do that, I think, is not always entirely clear. But I think by the time he got to the television show, 
um, and across the years of the television show, he grew increasingly confident in the role, you know. I was wondering, um, looking at your book cover, you have Cash wrapping himself in the American flag and the way our politics is now, one would assume that is a very conservative view. I mean, you would you would put him in the red stakes state. <laughs> I, I was just curious about the, the choice that you and your editors had for the, the cover. Well, the choice there's a, there's a lot of photographs of Johnny Cash and flags, right? He he's he made a couple of albums in the seventies, Ragged Old Flag album and uh, an album that's called America, uh, you know, a two hundred years salute uh, in song. I'm, I'm getting the subtitle wrong, um, but both of those he appears with the American flag and the Ragged Old Flag. It really is a ragged old flag hanging behind him, and he's kind of pointing at it and looking at you, the viewer. Um, but I think, you know, obviously the flag uh, is this symbol that is uh, loaded with meaning, and we can read it in lots of different ways. Um, and in the cover of the book, to me, what's interesting is he's holding up this flag that's kind of torn and tattered, you know. This is not a flag that uh, he's about to fly up the flagpole. And he himself looks a little torn and tattered, you know. Um, and it's, you know, I think it reflects in the early 70s when the photograph was taken, you know, the State of the Union and uh, perhaps the state of American citizenship. I mean, mostly we thought it was a really bold image and a great image to go with a title like Citizen Cash. but. Uh, it also reflects kind of the ways that you can read different meanings into cash and his politics and the way that that has happened, right? It's hard to separate it sometimes as that woman at the, at the auction house and I debated over ragged old flag. Um, you know, she thought that was clear evidence that uh, he was a dyed in the wool patriot, you know? Um, and others think that song is, you know, a critique uh, of America, of the America that he was living in at the time, you know, um, and what had happened to the flag uh, during the Watergate years, for example. I really yeah. agree with you. Just to jump in, I've, I'm stuck by, captivated by this picture. I've looked at it a lot. And yes, for some reason, conservatives are more prone to waving flags, but this is, it's in black and white. He's dressed in black. There's something about his visage and expression that is a little inscrutable. And it's really not clear what's being signified in this thing. I think it's one of these, it's a Rorsch, how do you say it? Rorschach? A Rorschach test. Right. Yes, exactly. You can it in different ways, but I was, I've been mesmerized by that. Yeah. yeah. Michael, did, did your views of Johnny Cash change throughout your research? I mean, if you go back to the, you know, to the very beginning where I was, uh, you know, kind of late breaking Cash fan. Like my my memory of Johnny Cash when I was a kid is similar to John's. Like I remembered him doing these television specials, which I thought were kind of geared towards, you know, my parents and older generations. And I didn't I didn't get some of the cornball humor and I just I didn't really get him, you know. Um and I didn't know anything about his son record years and in those days. It took until the nineties when the American recordings uh, albums came out and I, I went back and listened to the Sun Records and the prison albums and things like that. And I became a pretty passionate Cash fan. But, I, you know, the thing that what got me started was the Vietnam War, because that was where I had done all my research. And um, I had written this article that came out several years ago, wasn't really thinking that I was ever going to write a book. And so the thing that I really learned in the course of writing the book was just how deeply he was engaged across all of these different issues, including and especially civil rights, right? Including on race, because uh, he himself never really wrote about it in, or wrote very little about it in his autobiographies. And his other biographers didn't have much to say. In fact, he was often kind of criticized for being very outspoken on behalf of Native Americans and not saying much about African Americans. Um, but then as it turns out, and as I explained, there's a whole chapter dedicated to cash and race. Um, he was deeply committed 
to understanding the issue and to and to engaging it as a public citizen. Um, and so that was probably the biggest surprise to me, you know. One, I want to ask one last question. If you, if you had an opportunity to sit down with Johnny Cash and ask him a question, what would you, what would you ask him? Well, there are so many questions. Um, I mean, so just not to, not to beat a dead horse and stick with the same theme, but you know, I'm interested in the decisions that he made about making that Blood, Sweat and Tears album. And specifically, he makes lyrical decisions. He, he updates the lyrics in some of these songs, which are, you know, were like Lead Belly songs or famous folk songs, or uh, in the case of Another Man Done Gone, um, were, was a song you would only have heard on an Alan Lomax recording. And I kind of chart the way that other artists, you know, updated the song and added their lyrics. Um, but Cash never really talked about it. He never, he never said, yeah, this is why I decided to add this line or that line. And in Another Man Done Gone, he makes that song even more frightening than it's ever been recorded ever before. And I would love to just talk to him about that, you know, about what, what was happening uh, in his life, in his mind, in America at the time that made him decide to take this already pretty scary song and make it even scarier you'll have everybody will have an opportunity to to learn more about johnny cash the book is citizen cash michael stewart foley I want to thank you thank john mcmillan acapella books has the uh, has copies of citizen cash with uh, an autographed book plate in inside so you want to get it there uh, gentlemen thank you all very much i enjoyed this uh, immensely thank you and thank you and join us next time and check out Acapella Books uh, events for other uh, of events, author events that are coming up. Thank you all and have a good evening. Likewise, thank you. Thanks so much.